Hello again, I'm Matthew Gore from lightandmatter.org, and over the winter I spent a few months shooting all sorts of different things with the remarkable new Tamron 35-150mm f2-2.8 zoom lens. This lens is not like other Tamron lenses. It has already understandably gotten a lot of attention because of the fact that it has an f2 maximum aperture, making it the brightest zoom lens available for a full-frame Sony E-mount. But it's different in other ways too. When Tamron started making E-mount lenses, they made a decision to specifically make lenses that are compact to match the smaller bodies of mirrorless cameras. But this lens breaks all of Tamron's recently established rules. First of all, it's pretty hefty. Of course, it has to be as an f2 lens, but if we compare it to Sony's old 70-200 G Master lens, which weighs 1473 grams, the Tamron is getting pretty close at 1165, and it actually weighs 100 grams more than the new Mark II version of the Sony G Master. And until this point, all of Tamron's lenses for Sony E-mount, except for super telephotos, used 67mm filter threads. And that's different here as well. These are 82. They have also not provided manual switches in the past. This lens, though, has a manual focus switch, customizable autofocus buttons, and a multi-position switch to control the function of those buttons. And there's a zoom lock switch, too. There's also a USB port at the base of the lens to allow for direct firmware updates, and a button on the lens hood to lock it, which is something that I wish they had done with the 150 to 500 millimeter lens. Right Although here. it looks like I completely failed with attaching the lens hood here. That's awesome. Anyway, this is a heavy, sturdy lens with full controls that I think some people will say has a more professional feel to it. Because there are no other lenses like this one on the market right now, I'm going to compare its resolution to a few different lenses that I already have handy. A Sigma 35mm f2 prime lens, a Sigma 70mm f2.8 macro prime lens, and the Sony 70-200 f2.8 Mark I GM lens. But before that, I think it's worth considering. Who is this lens for? What's it good for? And the answer seems to be all sorts of general stuff. But more specifically, for me it seems like it may be the perfect lens for shooting basketball. I've said before that if you can shoot basketball in a high school gym, you can shoot it anywhere. And that's even more true with girls basketball. I don't think they even turn on all of the lights for the girls. Normally I shoot basketball with 24 to 70 and 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lenses, but I rarely use anything wider than 35 millimeters, and 150 millimeters seems to get the job done on the long end for just about anything on the same side of the court. So with this Tamron, I don't need to change lenses or carry two bodies. It's also wide enough at the 35mm end to capture players head to foot when they're near me under the basket. And of course, I could also zoom in for tighter compositions, all without changing lenses. And hopefully you can see here that the autofocus performance of the lens was no problem at all for shooting basketball, whether the players were close to me or not. Focus was sharp and tracking was solid, no problems at all. Actually. The only problem that I had was that my Sony a7R 3 tends to lose focus while zooming, even with Sony lenses, and since I zoom a little bit more often with this lens than my regular lenses, I did have to be a little more conscious of that. Otherwise, it was great. I also took the lens out to do a little general shooting around the city. Unfortunately, we've been having a very wet winter, so that mostly meant trying to take pictures of people in the rain, 
Overall, the lens was great. Again, autofocus was good, the zoom range was really useful, but uh, this is probably the only picture that I ended up liking. I think I liked it because of these different layers, the people here in the foreground walking and loading the truck, the textures and the depth of the middle, and of course, the woman and her dog walking in the covered sky bridge up top. Anyway, I also went out to look for some landscape shots, but I didn't have any luck at all. I did get some good contrasty shots to check for chromatic aberration though, and I didn't find any problems with the lens in that regard, even zoomed in to 200%. With a longish zoom range like this, especially with wide apertures, I'm always curious about how good the lens's resolution is going to be throughout the whole range. But before we look at that, I hope you'll take a second to like this video if you find this sort of thing useful. It's really helpful for smaller channels like mine. So using my standard testing methodology, I started comparing it with a Sigma 35mm f2 i series lens, which I really like. Starting with both lenses wide open and looking in the center of the frame, we can see that both of these lenses are already giving us wonderful resolution and detail. We can see all of the tiny antennas on top of these buildings, and the fine textures in the sides of the buildings. I'd be hard pressed to say that either lens is any better than the other here at 42 megapixels. Moving out to the edge of the frame, both lenses remain remarkably sharp, and there's still no practical difference between them. Maybe the Sigma has a little better contrast here, but I'm not even sure about that. And on the other side of the frame, trying to look through some of the trees at the signs on I-5 and some of the buildings, again, I don't see much difference. And that's really impressive for a zoom lens. I'm not going to compare these lenses at every aperture today, just so that we don't get too bogged down in this section, but let's take a quick look at f4, where both have been stopped down two stops. Here, it was raining on the Tamron side, so everything looks a little more flat, but the detail is very strong, at least as good as the Sigma in the center of the frame, and looking around the frame again, the same thing is still true. And that seemed to hold, regardless of the aperture. One thing you may have noticed is that the Sigma lens is clearly a bit wider than the Tamron is at 35mm. It's common for lenses to have a little bit of variation in that regard, especially when it comes to zooms. But let's take a quick look at how much difference there is here. Here you can see the full frame of a couple of these shots, and when I put the Tamron on top of the Sigma, you can get a pretty good idea of how much more the Sigma is capturing around the edge of the frame. If we assume that the Sigma is a true 35mm lens, then a couple of quick calculations show that the Tamron's field of view is what we would expect for about a 38mm lens. And while it's common for a lens's focal length designation to be off by about 5%, this is 8.3%, which is a little more than I'd like, though it's possible that the Sigma is actually wider than 35mm. But moving on, about halfway through the zoom range at 70 millimeters, let's see how the Tamron lens compares to the Sigma 70 millimeter f2.8 macro lens. With the Tamron lens zoomed so that its metadata registers 70 millimeters, there is still a visible difference in the fields of view again, so keep that in mind. Here in the center, they're both very sharp again, and I wouldn't say that there's a significant difference here. There's plenty of fine detail to compare, and sometimes I think that the Tamron is a little sharper, but that's really splitting hairs. They're both excellent. Now, moving up here towards the corner, they both stay nice and sharp, but looking at these wires on the top of the Space Needle, I think that the Tamron is giving us better resolution. It's hard to say definitively because of the differences in focal length, but it's certainly not any worse. And down in the opposite corner again, 
there's a lot of fine detail to compare, and if the Tamron is sharper, it's only just barely. They're both excellent. Nothing really changes at f4 or 5.6, and looking at f8, you can see that they're still equally good in the center. And looking at the top of the Space Needle, the Sigma has definitely caught up if it wasn't already as sharp as the Tamron. But I certainly don't think it's any better than the Tamron. And finally, let's take a look at the 150mm end of the zoom range. I don't have a prime lens to compare the Tamron to, and if you've seen my previous videos, you know that this Sony 72-200 is not super sharp at 2.8 in the center, so it's not too surprising that the Tamron is a little bit sharper here, though neither one is bad. The bars on these railings make it pretty clear. But when we move up to the corner, the situation is not so obvious. Here I'd say that the Sony has much better contrast, so it's a little sharper, although it has a tiny bit of streakiness that reduces some of the fine detail. So the resolution of the Tamron is probably still a bit better. Looking down in the opposite corner again, the Sony is a bit sharper, but here I don't see that streakiness that I mentioned before, and I think that the Sony has the better resolution here. Looking at the text on this sign and this sign. Stopping down to f4, the Sony lens improves quite a bit in the center of the frame, and now I can't say that one is definitively better than the other. Up in the corner, both look good now. I think that the textures are a little bit better on the Tamron, but the contrast is better on the Sony. And down here, there's really no difference, and that becomes the rule once I stop down further. At f5.6 and f8, it's impossible to tell them apart. So the lens is sharp. It's sharp enough for landscape photography or wherever else you might need very high resolution. Now let's take a look at the lens's bokeh, that is the rendering of the out of focus portion of the images. In general, I was pretty happy with the bokeh from this lens, regardless of the focal length. The background was nice and smooth at f2 and 2.8, and the transitions from foreground to background look good to me too. You will notice some raindrops on my lens in the highlights back here, but no major artifacts are fringing at this level of magnification. Here where these Christmas tree lights are in the foreground, there's some unusual duplication of the bokeh balls, which is a little unusual, but I only noticed it this once. And there was also this shot that I showed earlier, where the little lights in the background when we zoom in all make a little bullseye, which is strange and not very smooth, but again, this is the only time that I noticed it. These are some white RGB LED string lights, and this is at the 35mm end at f2. The bokeh balls are nice and round generally, but I do get a little cat's eye shape towards the edge of the frame. Looking a bit closer, we see that the lights are nice and smooth with no obvious onion rings or other artifacts, but there is a fair amount of chromatic aberration you can see the cyan and yellow-green here. Here, the lens is zoomed to about 130 millimeters, and you can see that the cat's eye effect around the edge of the frame is a little more pronounced. And looking closer at the edges of these highlights, the chromatic aberration is more pronounced too. Here, it looks more magenta and blue on one side, and yellow-green on the opposite. I should mention that this effect is especially strong when shooting LED lights like this. I haven't seen it in normal shooting. And finally, this is 150mm at 2.8, and again there's some chromatic aberration and some cat's eye at the edge of the frame. And now before I wrap this up, let's take a quick look at the lens's vignetting. If you turn off the correction profile for the lens, 
in camera or in Lightroom, you'll see that at the 35mm end, the lens starts to give us a little bit of drop off around the edge of the frame at f4, and by f2, we're losing about 1.2 stops of light in the corners. Things are not as bad when we zoom into about 70 millimeters, where we only lose about two thirds of a stop of light when it's wide open. But I was a bit surprised to see that at 150 millimeters, vignetting becomes visible already at f8, and it increases to a loss of about one f-stop at f2.8. All of that is about average for a large aperture zoom lens, and it is completely corrected by the lens profile in camera or in Lightroom, so it's not a major concern. The same thing is true when it comes to distortion, incidentally. This lens controls distortion pretty well to begin with, and profile corrections then do a good job with it. For example, Here's a shot at 35mm in Samurai Noodle, near the King Street Station, and this is without corrections on. And this is with corrections. You can see that there's not a whole lot to correct, just a bit of barrel distortion. Same thing here, also at the 35mm end with no corrections on, and with corrections. The telephoto end of the zoom has a bit more distortion, but it's pincushion. Here's a shot with no correction at 150 millimeters, and here's with corrections on. You can see those lamp posts straightening out quite a bit, and the end result is pretty good. So where does that leave us? This lens has a lot of positives. The amount of light that it gives us is excellent. It's very sharp across the whole frame at every focal length, but especially the wider end, and it covers an extremely useful zoom range I found. It was excellent for sports like basketball, but it would also be great for weddings and portraits because the autofocus is fast and accurate and quiet, and the bokeh is generally very good, though it did produce some general weirdness in a couple of situations. Vignetting and distortion were also well controlled and easily corrected. The build quality is very high, and the lens has most of the manual controls that you'd probably want, though it is a little bit big and heavy for the casual shooter. And with that, it's also more expensive than many amateur photographers would be willing to spend, though I still consider it a good value for the price. With all of these positives, I'd quickly recommend this lens to anyone who shoots weddings, concerts, indoor sports, events and journalism of any sort, and people who are serious about their travel photography. It would also make a solid portrait lens for those who don't want to carry a bunch of primes around, and it's just a good solid lens for general shooting all around. Wildlife photographers and a lot of sports photographers will want something longer, and it's not going to be ideal for anything that needs a very wide field of view but it's a great lens for just about everything in between. And that's it. My next video is about a very interesting piece of equipment for shooting video. And if you're interested in seeing that, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Until then, keep shooting. <laughs>